Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Peter Bolden, and we have Dr. Craig Spodak on the other side. Craig and I haven't talked in a while, so this is going to be an extra special podcast <laughs> because I have one of my good buddies on, a New York Times, a recently, wait, Chris, are you New York Times? USA Today. I had the USA number Today here. bestseller. So Chris Tuff is on with us. And Chris is the director of content marketing and partnerships at a huge uh, marketing firm in Atlanta called 22 squared. And um, so Chris, I don't know where to start on this journey. I, I know you and I haven't known each other a, a super long time, but we met through a mutual friend and you actually approached me because you were writing a book about the millennial generation, which Craig and I talk about all the time. And I've got a funny story with this because I actually stole some of Craig's thunder and, got it integrated into your book. I love it. You're going to love this story. I actually, I actually, I actually disclaimed that to him on while we were at stage on our summit. I said, look, I have it. I have something I needed to tell you that I took one of your ideas because Craig and I share very uh, transparently amongst best practices, our practice, because we both want each other to succeed. And so Craig, the ADS box that you have written in your book, Chris, yeah, was originally a Spodak buck. So essentially, Pete, you're getting national notoriety uh, for my idea. But I don't have any. But no, that's what, Chris put me in there multiple times. Uh, but but that was a good one that everyone talks about. And I do want to give credit where credit is due because I did modify and tweak it a little bit. But the genesis of the idea came from the Spodak Dental Group. So I love it. Well, um, thanks for that. So, but look, yeah, there's no, no new Bonus. idea. We only have a short time today. But um, I just want to like unpack your whole journey, why you, why you wrote this book called the millennial whisperer. Um, that is literally like the book launch is tonight really well. And I shouldn't say the launch, but the signing is tonight. So this is a very new published entity that it's going to be a massive brand. Um, you guys watch here it is. Boom. Boom. So I like it. nice cover. go, I'm going to stop talking here and I want you to jump right into your journey, unpack it a little bit, and then maybe how we can jump into some dental analogs of your story and kind of yeah. what you see uh, for dentistry and stuff. So sure. anyway, sorry for the long-winded intro, kind yeah. of intro, but buddy, I'm so glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, you know, in writing this book, one of the big challenges I got from different people was, uh, you know, what's this mean for my business? And that was the, the people I heard it from the most were people with, you know, uh, some sort of practice in the medical field or restaurants. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I needed in this book examples for each of those. And then that's when I called Bolden and I was like, B, you know, what, what do you guys do in any one of these areas? And he started telling me this stuff. I'm like, Oh my God, you're going to be in the book at least a few times. And now here we are. But um, you know, I, th I think so many books when I wrote this book, it was, it's got to be a painkiller, not a vitamin. There's so many books out there that are just vitamins that people buy for the sake of buying because it makes them feel better in the moment, but it's not actually doing anything in changing the way that they manage their people or lead or think about the world. And that was one of my greatest kind of filters for everything. And, and I think as we talk about your examples, they're great examples of things. Anyone listening today, sorry, Craig, but hopefully after this podcast, everyone will have their version of ADS bucks or Spodak bucks, but we'll get into that. Um, Cause that's the impact I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. And so if you kind of go through fast forward, my whole thing, my life has become a ruthless pursuit of passions. And I think in our society, we get so distracted by money or pleasing our parents or whatever it is that we end up forgetting what drives us in our head and heart. And my journey looks like that. I had 64 job interviews after graduating from Vanderbilt, you would think it would be easier for me to find a job, but it just ended up that I wasn't passionate about any of the interviews. And then I ended up falling into this digital advertising firm called Moxie. I was the 13th employee. We grew from 13 to 800 within four years. What that allowed me to do was make lots and lots of lateral moves. I was an account executive. I was a creative copywriter. And then I found my niche right around 2006 in this new digital space. And it was before social media was called social media. I actually ended up, I talked about how I had dinner with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, he was still expanding, just about to expand from colleges into brands. 
And he didn't say one word to me at dinner, but I did have dinner with him. <laughs> um, well, you know, his but, dad's a dentist, you know that? I did. I, that, that's right. That's yeah. right. Still practices, apparently. Well, maybe he's watching right now. Uh, that would be super cool. Hey, Doc Zuck, if you're <laughs> listening to this, hit me up. Yeah. But so, you know, that's kind of where, where I, I emphasize with all this, you know, you see people, this generation bounce around a lot. And one of my big things is embrace that, like bounce around, go find your thing that drives you. And um, that's where then from 2006 on, you know, I was told that if I got my first viral video, they'd give me my own department in this new trend spotting and social media space. And so I recorded my engagement video of my wife and I running. I went from spraining my ankle to popping the question. I put it on ChristopherTuff.com because YouTube wasn't around. I ended up getting 7 million views four days later. Good Morning America flew down. And then we ended up getting our pictures on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was ridiculous. And so they're like, okay, Chris, you can have your own department. But I always use that as an example of like, that, the reason this stuff happens is because I'm so passionate about it. And I start my, my book about, you know, one of the best diagnoses I've ever been given, and it was by my older brother. He turned to me as I was passionately talking about social media marketing. And he goes, Chris, you've got a passion disorder. I was like, mm -hmm. uh, is that a bad thing? He was like, no, it's actually a good thing. You get so passionate. And so, you know, you kind of look at the evolution of me in the social space. I grew out the social practice at my firm now, 22 Squared, where I'm a partner. And what I found was as I transitioned to more being the face of the agency is that like I was feeling empty in a lot of ways because I was the face of the organization publicly but I wasn't affecting lives the way I wanted to. And, and, you know, I called Pete right after I hit rock bottom and I was like, dude, we got to go kiteboarding. I kind of lost my way a little bit. And, um, that was where everything changed. And, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to put all of my, one thing that I changed was my own metric of success. And my old metric of success was beating my brothers, my older brothers in the game of life, which is not a great metric to, to have a success metric. And I changed it to, judging success on a daily basis, the amount of energy put in and impact made. And that can be judged only when your head hits the pillow. And uh, that's when I started shifting. I'm like, I'm gonna put all my energy into this team of millennials that I have. So I kind of shifted back into my core from being the face of the organization into a group of about 15 millennials. And I started implementing a lot of these things. I'm like, I wonder if this will work. I wonder if this will work. But basically all those things that I was implementing were either hypotheses or things that I'd heard of, of, of what it takes to just be a good human. And everything I do nowadays kind of, I think revolves around the need for two key things, which is more empathy and love. I think deep down, whether it be your patients, whether it be the people that work with you, deep down, everyone just wants to be loved. And, and the other piece is just connection. Just be real, like create a real human connection with people. And so tactically I started doing this and I was on a men's retreat and what ended up birthing the book was I was on this men's retreat, which Pete is a part of the exchange, this men's kind of group about helping men become better men. And we talk about real stuff um, and we network and whatever, but I was at this first exchange event, which was kind of an experiment in North Georgia mountains. And, uh, uh, we were going around introducing myself and they're like, so what do you do, Chris? And I was like, I don't really know what I do. You know, we're 370 employees at my advertising firm, but you know, I'm kind of like the millennial whisperer. And then I sat back down mm -hmm. and the guy next to me, Tommy Breedlove, who's a big kind of, who's going to be on, he's a big, big time. And he's, and he's, uh, he's going to be on the podcast in about a month. So awesome. Amazing. Yeah. So sorry, Chris. And executive, you know, Tommy, I didn't know Tommy at the time. We've now since become best friends. And he wrote the forward of my book, but he kicks me. He goes, you better write that book. And I was like, what book? He goes, The Millennial Whisperer. I was like, have you met me? I'm like the most ADD. There's no way I'm writing a book. He was like, well, let me introduce you to some people. Nick Pavlidis, who's actually here for our book launch. Let me introduce you to him. He'll bring order to a little bit of your chaos. And that was 14 months ago. And we fast forward. And we ended up last week, we sold 16,000 copies. Uh, we, I mean, numbers that my publisher, Morgan James, I guess, hasn't ever really seen. And, you know, I've got interviews and a lot of the big kind of cable news and whatever. Didn't so, Tommy taunt you with, if you don't write it, I yeah. will. 
Yeah, mm, it's always like, awesome. if you don't write it, I will. Yeah, that's, that's really going to get the competitive juices flowing in you. So, yeah, it's been amazing to watch, Chris, just seeing it from concept of us sitting in Quincy's pool talking about, like, you know, just spitballing about what I do in my practice to help, you know, with the millennials in mind. And Craig and I talk about this a lot. as how millennials get a bad rep. Um, and a lot of the dental workforce is composed of them. What, what is exactly the dates of, of 82 to 96? So in application, 23 year olds to 36 year olds. Wow. Which is a a predominant force. Wouldn't you agree, Craig? How much of your office falls in that bucket? It's huge. It's huge. It's so funny listening to this because I've just got so many uh, interesting anecdotal stories about stuff like this from the SDG bucks and onward. But one of the initiatives I've ha- I had for our 2017 annual meeting was I just came to this point, much like what you're saying, Chris, I'm like, I just want to create more love and connection in the organization. That was my major directive. So we came up with a, you know, our mission and our mission was really about creating compassionate compassion, you know, which is arguably what love is made of empathy and totally. compassion. Yep. And it, it's an interesting social experiment that I've learned how that can backfire on you. And it's very relevant to, you know, the SDG Bucks program that we launched and some other initiatives that we launched. But, and also I happen to be a father of a six and nine year old. So same it's- Same here, same ages. So there's a massive amount of learning yeah. and what constitutes making people feel whole, valued, complete, and loved and how giving things to them without any consequence or reward or metric associated will create the opposite. And I think there's a lot, I mean, I'm unpacking a lot and I don't want to hijack your thought process, but I want to circle back to this because, you know, when you, when you have everything, you're less happy. Millennials, Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to, I don't like to uh, paint with broad brushstrokes. I was corrected by a a guest we have on the podcast, Mark Cooper, who literally tore tore me apart because he was saying, you can't speak about an entire generation like that. It's callous and, and reckless to say that. But um, there are certain generational traits that are affected, but there's one commonality in that if your intent is to make people happy and feel loved, the way you do that is not by just giving things to them. It it actually backfires on you. It backfires with your children. It backfires your employee space. So the iteration of SDG Bucks program that we launched in our practice was every month, every person in the organization got 50 SDG Bucks. You couldn't redeem it for cash. Because we realize that experiences, you'll remember a lifetime. I remember special dinners for my entire life. But someone giving me $200 or $400 does not register in the who gets a crap meter. So it had to be for that. You couldn't give it to the same person more than once. Can't pay bills, right, with it. And we, and it, and we can't use it to pay bills. Um, if you do use it to redeem cash, you're just going to take a 50% deduction on it. So it's highly incentivized for experiences and, and stuff like that. And what we found... Um, It was at first a very cool experiment in meritocracy because certain people would come up to me and say, hey, I have $1,500 in SDG bucks. And other people would say, this is not fair because I only have 100. And it was really cool to point back and say, wow, that's interesting. You only have 100. I wonder what's up with that. And it was just because work itself is very paternalistic. It's like, it's almost like, you know, hey, daddy, I showed up today. Can I get a raise? You know, I sat in my seat for another year. Can I get the gold star or raise? And we don't, life does not reward you just for showing up life rewards you for performance, but it actually really backfired on us. And I think a lot of people were really upset and the conversation Pete and I were having just when you got on board today, I have to unwind the benefit I was giving. Um, people don't respond well to that because once they're getting that gift, it's an entitlement. And um, I learned a lot through that SDG buck program and it so didn't, it didn't wind up making the love that I wanted. One modification, Chris, I think this is appropriate because, because it's a part in your book, the, the, the bucks, let's call it, is that I took that, that idea, which Craig and I do with each other. And that's the beauty of our, our friendship. But I said, look, it's, it's as a business, I can't give something just every month because we exist. Right? So mine are benchmarks upon are, are predicated upon the bucks are predicated upon hitting certain financial benchmarks from the previous month. So once they hit that mark, then they get to deploy it the next month. Right? It's not because if we have a shitty month, right? Like, it, I can't just be throwing out cash to everybody because like that is, so there's, there's reward metrics associated with like as a, as a team, which keeps us aligned. Right. And then everyone gets it at the same time for the next month. And then like Craig saying that the beauty of it is, is that there's a lot of social meritocracy we talk about, right. It's, 
It's just, mm-hmm. and what people crave is, you know, that's why Instagram is so popular is because people crave uh, acknowledgement, acceptance, all that stuff. Like how many likes did I get? How many shares did I get? How many hearts did I get? Whatever. Right. But if you're doing that publicly within your team, people crave that and they don't even know they crave it. Totally. So it's a cool thing to just literally, you know, Greg, I think that's been one of your, your best cultural uh, I don't want to call it hacks, but best cultural integrations that, that, that I've seen. It's, and I give you full credit, bud. Well, um, I mean, I think even on the rewards and recognition side, like, I mean, you've got to have a balance and like, we're not good at balance. None of us are. And, and the, unfortunately there's not near enough connection and love happening in most organizations. You guys are anomalies. I mean, you guys are so far on the spectrum, like all of these things. I'm talking to a lot of large corporations about the book. And you guys it. meaning and dentist or you guys? No, you no. too. Oh, yeah. you too you too are anomalies, right? Mm-hmm. So the other piece, I mean, in, in the book, I talk about my 70-30 role, which is we all suffer from the grass is always greener complex, whether mm-hmm. you want to admit it or not. And what changed that was really Instagram. And you know what I instill also in everyone's heads is you got to stop comparing your insides to other people's outsides. And I introduced my 70-30 role. And my 70-30 role is 30% of your job's always going to suck. And your job, like no matter what, 30% of life is tough. Mm-hmm. And 70% should fuel you up and keep you going and, and be somewhere in line with what you want to do. But 30% sucks. And listen, I'm a product of that. I talk about in my book how I hired a fishing guide when well, I was out in Sun Valley, Idaho, four years ago. And I told the dude, I was like, I don't care if I f- catch a fish or not. Like, catch me a freaking fish so I can post it on Instagram. And I want a picture of a video of me silhouette with the mountains in the background a river runs through in it like brad pitt here's 600 bucks he's like you're gonna pay 600 bucks for an instagram post i'm like no it's like 300 bucks each let's go and this guy looked at me like i was crazy and admitting that to everyone be like guys i've done it all right Uh... and what the 70 30 rule does is that it it constantly it says mow your backyard and start watering it because the light life is not perfect on the other side and then i also say all right the other thing is Sometimes you question where that 70% might be. And I call it my sitting in your car rule. And the sitting in the car rule is when you're sitting in your car and you're waiting to go to work and you have any sort, you know, you take the key out and you take that deep breath and you're like, all right, let's do this thing. If two days in a row, you have a source of dread, you have like a darkness that you're like, I don't really want to go in today. And it's not associated to your own procrastination or issues or your own um, self-development means, you know, you're pushing yourself then something's got to change. And listen, as your boss, I'll help open up the doors for you to find something new. I think the old me, I would be like, no, you're not leaving. You can't leave me like that. Where's your loyalty? And I'm like, listen, dude, if you want to go, I'll help you. Um, You know, and then another thing I think that's instilled in this generation is my last tirade is that we've got to fuel our people with purpose and passion that might not be in their day to day. So let's help them. Let's give them 10% of their time to donate their time to a side hustle. I encourage yeah, everyone. Yeah, that's Google. Like Google did yeah, that, Yeah, right? Google does their 10% role. We're 10% of their time. A lot of their moonshots have graduated out of side hustles of employees. And- but a, lo- a lot of this too is born out of like ridiculous profitability in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like reckless free lunches free, and yeah so, so like i i learned a lot of my initial i read delivering happiness by tony shea like you know back when it came out in 2013 or whatever and that really shaped me and a good buddy of mine scott galloway uh scott galloway is a uh, best-selling author as well and big commentator in cnbc i take him to lunch he's like you know your business reeks of a couple things i'm like what he's like innovation and high touch and low ebitda and I feel like you read too many aspirational books about leadership and management. And here you are going to be paying the price for it because back in the day, Google, Facebook were so, they were flush with VC and PE. They had so much money. They, did, they just could just do whatever they want. I think you can run a high touch who gives a shit culture. Like we'll just pay for everything. But what, what really millennials are looking for is like not really a boss, but a coach and talent development is costly as fuck. It's costly like to develop, in my opinion, especially it's, but like to take someone that's, you know, that, um, that, you know, listen, I'm, I, I'm, 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 being, I'm putting myself in a devil's advocate position with you because I preach this stuff all day long. So it's like, um, I'm just, and I'm also in a spot today where I had to undo some big benefits. So I'm in an interesting place, 
But I do believe that there are certain people, and I don't want to just say millennials, but certain people, if you're around anything long enough, you tend to take it for granted. And um, we have a lot of people that come in to, the, to an organization like mine. I'm like, oh my God, free lunch every day. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. And invariably six months later, it's like, oh, chicken again? It's like, <laughs> you know, what do you mean? Like, so I just think that there is, there is a law of diminishing returns when you're giving away a lot of this stuff. I just, I just believe that. Yeah. I mean, I agree to a certain extent, but you know what, like my favorite quote about this thing is millennials aren't the problem. They just expose the problem. Or me, when I met with a buddy of mine, who's a boomer at a fortune 50 company. And he was the, you know, he read the book three times. He's one of the stories in the book, Mike Hibison, he works for the home Depot and he's a senior merchant over there. And I knew he was going to either rip me or give me criticism. I'm like, dude, I'm too, this is my heart, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm too far in this journey. I don't want criticism right now. And he was like, no, actually it's not criticism. It's, you know what, what I, after reading the book, I'm kind of like a millennial, Chris. And, and he kind of whispered it and I'm like, exactly. What I'm trying to expose here is just, we have evolved as a society so quickly and uh, technology being a huge driver of that and our corporations haven't caught up. I would say you guys are anomalies, right? I mean, the private practice, small business side, you can affect change in culture a lot quicker than these larger because we're si yeah because of because our we're size and size yeah we're, and we're more agile we're more agile yeah right yeah. and some of the elements of like just around connection is stop having your one-on-ones with people and talking about business the whole time ask them about their family ask them about their pet or their extracurriculars because at the end of the day if we are to assume that role as a coach, to your point, Craig, or as a leader, then we got to start with real connection. And I think we, so many people forget it. So I think you've got to give yourselves credit for being so far along on this journey and to be on the right side of this spectrum. And I'm talking to some of those com companies about, I'm talking to some of those big startup-y, massively funded, profitable institutions. And where I focus with them on, it's like, guys, let's focus on helping your employees identify individual purpose. You know, let's execute, what does that look like in an online course and something where you, they can put a stake in the ground about their own purpose. And then we, as coaches and leaders, can marry what they're currently doing and what you guys represent as an organization and start talking about how you get that person from here to there. That, that's such a dangerous proposition to me. You know, that, that, when you said that, I would, it just got me all like, God, I would hate to, ha I would hate to help all these people only to find that they would realize the purpose was not where they're working. And therefore like all I did was hustle to get them out of a job, which they were already content, you know, and that's the selfish part. I'm just playing again, Craig sure. played devil's advocate, but I'm saying like, wow, like to do all that. And then to really get someone to say, you know what? I just want to be a blogger. I don't want to be a dental assistant. I want to be a blogger or whatever. Right. And then you're like, Oh, what have I done? Yeah. Well, I, I think, listen, I think it bears to mention as you were talking, Chris, I'm thinking like I, I, I argue, I, I, I was a little bit contrary to your points, but when you look at the general conversation that's going on in dentistry and I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not proud to admit it, but kind of like eavesdropping on Facebook pages of dental dentists talking, you know, these different, these chat rooms and the conversation that's going on is so far away from what Pete and I are you talking about right now that I can't, I can't, I want to, I want to just bring one thing up. It's like the conversations typically around how do you, what are you doing so that your employees are not on their cell phones? Oh, well I make it, I have them check their cell phone in at eight 30. They don't get it until 5 PM. Like, Holy shit. Like, Oh my God. Like that's like you, you, you're not, people are not the, the work work has changed and people talk about a work ethic. And it's now it, that work ethic is different now. And I think it bears me to mention that back in the day, you were a factory worker and you shut, you shut the hell up. You did your job, the bell whistle, and you, you, were, you were just putting the nut on the bolt all day. You just would do one process in a long chain of, a, of an assembly line. Now what we're requiring people is, is the consumer craves an experience. They crave, you know, they want to go into a restaurant and say, hey, what's the fish of the day? Oh, my God, I'm so happy you asked because Johnny spearfished it this morning and rah, rah, rah. It's amazing. And Chef John, I, I you know, they, they want the whole story. And if you want to be a story brand, if you want to have a compelling story about who you are, the whole human needs to show up to the employee. You can't just take the process out of the employee. You need the whole messy human. 
the happiness, the sadness, totally. the full gamut of the experience of hum humanity. And that's messy as shit. And most dentists are not willing to do that. And I know Pete and I are. So I'm commiserating because I'm talking to you and I'm talking to Pete. But the context going on is how do we process control the shit out of our people? How do we turn our people into robots? And if you're really as a dentist having that conversation, your business is going to suck. Because if well, you and look at the stats. I mean, I, I've memorized the stats at this point. As leaders, as not as organizations, as leaders, what millennials are looking for, according to the 2018 Deloitte Millennial Survey, is one, inspirational leadership, two, autonomy, and three, transparency. And you better as hell Say not this again for me, Chris. Do it again. Yeah, make, so one, inspirational leadership. Inspirational that, leadership, okay. So uh, two, autonomy. They want their, autonomy. Day -day they, don't want, they want the opposite of control. Which is what Craig and, always says. And yeah. three, they want transparency. And now here's the funny thing about all three of those things. Ask Bob, who's the boss of whoever, whatever practice you have. Ask Bob, hey, Bob, are you an inspiration? You know, number one for millennials is inspirational leadership. Bob, are you an inspirational leader? And Bob will say, hell yeah, I'm an inspirational leader. Have you seen everyone that works with me when I'm talking to them? They light up. And then you go ask to the people on Bob's team and you're like, hey, dude, will you just tell me, is, is Bob an inspirational leader? And they'll turn and they'll say, hell no, he's not. He bores me to tears. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, so what am I going to do about that? Well, I created a millennial leadership assessment, which is available on the millennial uh, whisper.com. I worked with one of the top professors at Vanderbilt. And it is essentially a 360 survey starting with uh, inspirational leadership that gets your own self-evaluation, but also of your people to see what they think of you along What's with What's the autonomy. web address for that? Uh, the, the millennial whisper.com. And, and then, you'll find the free. And it's, and it's completely double, it's double blind that people have anonymous feedback. Yeah. It's exactly. hard. I think I, we mentioned that in our book. I think that if you're not willing to get that blind um, 360 Yep. feedback you're not you're not an inspirational leader if, and it's hard i've done that i've had like executive coaches come in and ask stakeholders what are the five things i should do and never do and it's really hard and by the way how you show up at work typically all the faults you have at work and we all have faults they're pretty similar to stuff you're doing at home too so you yep. don't work on one domain in your life and not have it affect the others yeah well i mean and i think you know another one of those is i think a lot of people misinterpret um like transparency what's People think that transparency means that you have to stand up in front of your people and either tell them all of your financials or cry. And it's like, no, how about this? Let's start with last week, name one mistake. Start your speech when you're doing your all hands meeting and start with the one mistake. Show your people that you're just human. So it's Stop humility to too. It. So it's yeah. transparency and humility. Got it. Exactly. I love that. That's, that I can agree, agree with. Yeah, because- Well, those build trust. You know, if you're pontificating that you're the big, you know, I mean, listen, back in the day, you know, by being my meaning back in the day, 10 years ago, you could just be this iconic person because of your stature and everybody's bent down and worshiped you. Now being the man is actually to your detriment. The more, the more successful you are, the more dose of humility you need. I mean, yeah. there's an attack on people that are successful. They tear them down. Totally. So I think that as you rise in your stature, you have to have a commensurate rise in your humility. Yeah. People demand more from you. Totally. So Chris, you talk about like literally, the, I think the, one of the, the taglines of your book is, you know, it's the playbook for the millennial generation, yep. right? Yep. Am I right? Am I right on that? Or am I just saying that? No, you're, you're right. You're okay. right. Um, so, so practical profit focused playbook. So really? can you give any more? So I love to, I'm always the guy who tries to go tactical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you give us some, obviously there's a lot of anecdotal stuff. There's some stories yep. in there, not only about Spodak and ADS bucks, but also kind of what the, my ADS cares program where I align people, you know, philanthropically, uh, altruistically through, through, um, you know, the charity that we want to be aligned with. And so that's created more for having them feeling good about what they're doing. You know, if the business is doing well, then obviously we can, we can give back, but that creates the alignment and man, that, that just does so many powerful things in my, uh, but can you give some more, I guess what I'm trying to say yeah. is I'm always wanting to give pearls and tips and, 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 and tactics for people, um, as opposed to sometimes just theory is what a lot of podcasts talk about. So can you give some hacks on what, what we could give to our colleagues so, day yeah. one? 
So I'm going to start with also what makes this generation different? Well, one, I start the book by you got to divide this uh, this generation into older millennials, which I call Oregon Trail millennials and younger millennials, which is <laughs> Snapchat millennials. Because the older millennials, they grew up with, they, they didn't grow up with a cell phone. They grew up on- Wait, is it Oregon, Oregon Trail the game you're talking about? Yeah, the about? game. Like oh. they're or they played Oregon Trail at some point during their education. Like you guys are laughing at it because it's true. Those I are the older it, millennials. If you know what it is, yeah, yeah. then you're an older millennial. I'm not a millennial. You're, uh, you're a little bit older than that, right? <laughs> the other one is like the Snapchat millennial. Hey, Craig's the definitely not a millennial. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm 47, but I actually yeah. think like one. I really yeah. do. So I, I mean, really... I, I think all three of us do. We wouldn't be, be yeah. we wouldn't be talking about this stuff if we if we weren't. But you know, and then so, but the, what makes them so different and generationally is when the recession of 2008 hit either them the older ones were in the marketplace or about to actually enter it, um, or their parents. Younger millennials saw their parents lose their jobs before going off to college. Or in the younger millennials, they were nine. You know, so they were in these formative years and they saw their mom and dad lose their jobs. So as they're entering the marketplace, they're like, I need a place to hang my hat. The less I need security, it's opposite from the older ones. And so you also look at then the other huge variable, what makes them very different generations within that massive span of 82 to 96 is when in their life they adopted technology and social media. Because the younger ones, the Snapchat millennials, from 13 on, anytime they wanted instant gratification, they got it with a like and a post anytime they wanted it. And you look at the older millennials, a lot of them were in college or after college until they got their first smartphone and Facebook was hitting the, 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 the scene, their senior year of college. So what it's done is it's created across, a, a I'm getting over my passion disorders taking over. Yeah. <laughs> but it, what it does is it creates two very different generations. And so, you know, you look at some of the tenets of the book and you look at the reward and recognition one being one, right? And ADS box is a great example of that. Um, or what do you call it? Now it's, now it's, well, now it's SDG books. SDG, yeah, SDG books. books. But Sorry. let me just touch on that since you touched on that. Sure, that sure. I, I, you know, if you steal from one, it's plagiarism. If you, if you steal from many, it's research. So I, I want to give the original thought of that to um, Chuck Blakeman, who is also a very um, well-recognized author. He wrote um, Why Employees Are Always a Bad Idea. Um, and he was the one who did, came up with that idea. I um, love it. Yeah, so, so it's, Chris, it's all been I want to ask you something, but you just said it. It just literally put chills on me. Is that, you know, we always think of 2007, 8, 9 being, or, or really just 2009 being catastrophic from a financial world. But are you saying that it was a pivotal point in a cultural standpoint? Because, yes. yeah, of course. People, I, I never thought about like that. Yeah, they, they see their, they they see the their, pain, almost like yeah. the Great Depression did for like my grand. Father, right? Yes. He saw it and, it, and it totally. But the younger sense. ones, like the ones that are entering the marketplace, those twenty-three, they were almost too yeah. young to remember it. So I think that's a that's a huge difference of what we're now dealing with Generation Z, of what's coming after. They haven't really seen that. Like we expect uh, yeah, it. We're like, when's it coming? They've next? been in the bull market the entire. They're almost right. their entire. It's like we're like, when's it coming? Like when or when's it all gonna come down again? Mm -hmm. Where so. So what I'm saying, though, is regardless, is we have all changed drastically. Like just those differences, what it's done to our brains and what it's meant in terms of getting the needs for rewarding and recognizing people, whether you want to admit it, it has. And I say to everyone I know that if your head hits the pillow and you're not utterly exhausted from overheroing and building up your people that day, you haven't done it enough. And so you want to talk about tactics? Peter, I think we start with rewards and recognition. We've talked about the bucks. You know, the ridiculous example I use in the book is, uh, and what I say is it doesn't always, it's not always financial. It's actually some of the best rewards and recognition programs are peer to peer in your case with the bucks where they're actually giving it to each other um, or it's, it's something more oh. symbolic. Yeah, Craig has like, is that your internal Facebook? Well, well no, we, I wanted to just mention something kind of, in, yeah. I'm loving what you're saying and I'm so happy that we're having this conversation because it's, um, it's uh, uh, just refreshing to hear this again. But this morning, like, you know, there's a, a saying I always love. It says the, the getting is in the giving. 
and you know obviously there's been many quotes about like you know getting is what you make a you know living out of and what you give makes a life but this morning in the middle of the night last night i wrote up because we do this thing called the kudos program in the morning and we say who did something exceptional yesterday and typically it takes a little jump start sometimes but it'll go on and on and on and last night yes last night this is the note i wrote it says kudos ashley p for invisalign dad for being humble dr alfredo for erica for helping me every day susie for a guide exactly. Mike for being amazing wow. natalie for a quick growth wow i, mean, I love it uh, All right, so I'm Jojo go and Michelle for making each day amazing like that was just it. that was just last night you know so i just it went on and on chris and on. is getting excited over there no, but it was, <laughs> this is also like, my favorite and, part. and it was from fed last night at 11 o'clock at night and i did it at 8 35 this morning but every day if you can f- listen what's wrong is always available but so yeah. is what's right yeah, the human brain is a two million year old organ that's always looking for what's wrong. It's what kept us alive. The brain, as Tony Robbins always says, the brain is an instrument of survival, not of happiness. Yep. So left to the default, it's always looking, is that person trying to hurt me? Is this thing going to attack me? Is that roof going to fall? Is this thing the car going to swerve away? So it's your job to cultivate gratitude without yep. your daily practice of you know, cultivating that, you're just going to find everything going fucking wrong. Totally. And it's our job as leaders, managers, and uh, business owners to find out what's going wrong. So that's what we are told, like find out what's going wrong. And, and if you could just spend a little bit of time catching people doing things right, I know that sounds so fucking cliche, but magic starts happening because it shifts your perspective, shifts your energy. And people can tell whether you're happy or sad and pissed off and a happy leader gets more shit done than an upset leader. Yeah. You want to please the happy leader. If you're always bitching, you know, it's, it's going to get worse. But um, I think that it's just really important to have that, that daily practice. And for, for one takeaway from, from my viewpoint is just try to find an, a team member doing something right. We never say staff. We never call them employees. I never say that this person works for me because the semantics are so important. To co- Everybody works with me. I've never said in my entire life that person works for me. They work with me. If they win, I win. If they don't win, I, I you know, and I, I love those conversations where you could tell people like to use, use your language, Pete, that we're equally yoked. The better you do, the better I do. Yeah. Pete help, helped me through a really tough conversation I had with an associate doctor recently. It's just like, you've got to get aligned. You've got to say I'm in your corner, but it's up to him to make that growth and that change. So I just painted the picture of bro. If you don't course correct, you're going to fail. And if you fail, I fail. Cause and if you do better, I do better. And it was a really cool conversation. Cause I've always had, and maybe many of the listeners can resonate with this. I've always had a desire to be liked. And if you're a pleaser and you want to be liked, it's not even about that fucking person. It's about you. You're being a selfish jackass. A pleaser is a selfish jackass, a giver, whether you like me or not, I'm going to help you. And that's where I think the, a lot of leadership has to come into play. Well, I'm going to add a tactic to, I think this and kind of right in line with what you're talking about in that text, but I start, so this is the more like, okay, what's, what's something that we can implement tomorrow or today in our team status, when you get everyone together that we can start incorporating pieces of this in. So I did it. And actually I didn't steal this from someone. Unlike you guys steal everything. It seems like from other from each other. We're going to, we're going to rewrite your book, by the way. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah, please do. But we're I the start dental, all of we're, my- the dental, we're the patient whisperers. Yes. Yeah. We're the dental millennial whisperer. But uh, so I start our team statuses with what I call snaps and snaps is where we start every, we just do peer to peer recognition. And I usually start us off and I was like, listen, I'm going to give snaps to Meg. She went above and beyond for that pitch or she was going through a tough time and she showed up and she covered and she kept, and so snaps and then everyone just goes and does snaps that happens. And I've, we're now a year and a half into this every single weekly, our team statuses, we do this. It lasts between 20 and 40 minutes. That's awesome. So, wow. and you know what it does? It, it, so you know how we used to do statuses is we'd all fill out an Excel spreadsheet and talk about what we were working on. And it's like, all right, wow, wow, Charles, wow. you're up. Well, I did this. You cover everything that would be on that status sheet. And it creates this environment of building each other up and empathy and, and recognition. And so my more extreme example in the book, that's where I end it. Um, the more extreme example is a company out in San Francisco. And this company is called Domo. They refer to all of their employees as Domo Sapiens. And on your first day, a Domo Sapien will put their name and then there's a Spotify playlist that they have to add their uh, at bat song on or, you know, their, their song of the day that if they're going to go and speak in front of a huge crowd, what's that song going to be? 
And so you put that, you know, we are the champions or whatever. On the first day of every month, at the middle, at the very beginning of the day, through their loudspeakers, someone's at bat song goes, blue sirens go off, and then everyone starts clapping as they drag a 12 foot blue rooster to the desk of that salesperson of the month. And, and that everyone is clamoring to have that 12 foot blue rooster sitting next to their desk. What's the monetary reward? Nothing. Yeah. But guess what? It works, you know? And that's something that I think is cool. That is awesome. So you, you, like, know, you could do that with a rabbit in your yard. Yeah, sure. you could. You should Craig has the Peter. biggest rabbit in all of South Florida. It's like a pink giant 20 foot rabbit. I love it. I told um, my daughters that I'd buy one of them a, a, a horse if I sold a million bucks. And my other daughter said, Okay, well, then will you get me a bunny? I was like, yeah, I'll get you two bunnies if I sell bucks. <laughs> so, so you know what's interesting is that, that the market crash and all that stuff, it's, it's a pendulum of, you know, it's a pendulum. And, and, and for the longest time, work used to be this oppressive thing. And people respected authority. And people would just shut up and do their job. And, and I think boomers, if anything, were really good at faking like we're busy. So we can fake engagement really well. You think about George Costanza taking a nap under his desk and he's like, George Costanza at Seinfeld will always say, just look like you're angry at work and then people would never ask you to do anything. So you're walking around like, oh, oh, like what's wrong? I need you to make copies. You know, just look like you're angry. And millennials are just different. Millennials won't fake it. And, and I think that the, the, now you need to have something compelling to work for. So we have charity programs and we have you know, corporate gift match programs. So if you donate to any charity, we match the donation. We actually have our own non-for-profit, a children's dental charity, which we started with uh, New York um, um, Yankee, uh, John Carlos Stanton. But I wanna give one small piece of advice because the concept of the boss is a hard thing for millennials to, to really resonate with. So I constantly say this in the practice. We all work for the same boss in this practice. The boss is the patient. We all serve the patient. So my boss is the patient. So if, you need, if, if I'm asking you to do something, but there's a patient that needs you to do something, that trumps everything. So the boss is the patient that's either in front of you that you're taking care of. And if you can resonate or cultivate a message around that, then that takes a lot of the hierarchy that's disruptive to the millennial mindset out of it. That there's not, there's not, a, there's not a guy up at front whipping. It's just saying we all, we all work for that same. Body. I would have added that to my book had, I, had, had we been about uh, six months ago. Darn well, it. well p you did add everything in my book. You just gave uh, to your book, but you just gave Peter credit for it. I just got attribution so, for it. Yeah, you just yeah. got attribution for it's it. Really good. Good. I really like that. But it's, but it's not the hierarchy and, 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 you know, the Garfield picture with Monday sucks, just kill me and, sh and SMH, my life sucks. It's time for work. Millennials won't do it. They just won't do it. They'd rather make meaning than make money. And they'll rather join the Peace Corps and make no money. So you can't pay them, which is a beautiful quality, by the way, the army loves millennials. They're very good soldiers. Yeah. Um, but you can't pay them to do something just in the same way, you know, big corporations have all been dismantled and you can't, now big corporations are act, trying to act small. Yeah. So like Anheuser-Busch launching craft breweries and you have to only, you find out later, oh shit, this is Anheuser-Busch that owns this, it, you know, so. Well, I mean, and that pairs up really nicely to, you know, I think the George Costanza example is because George Costanza had to stay at work all day, every day. There was no flexibility to it. And if you look at what are millennials, statistically speaking, according to all the surveys, nothing really changes of what people are looking, what people are looking for from companies. They want money first. It doesn't change from generation to generation. That's the number one thing. Now, once we start actually breaking down two, three, and four, that's where we start seeing some differences and work flexibility of yeah. allowing people to work from where they want to work because this and what that opens up, that is people feel so, I think, um, like uh, claustrophobic just staying in one place. We all do. Like, so if someone wants to work from a coffee shop for three hours, then let them work from their coffee shop. Obviously, and it's and a they'll, little they'll work harder, by the way. When you, yeah. you know, studies show that when you give unlimited vacation time, people take less. Yeah. You know, and, and I always talk, when I talk to employees, I talk with in the word, uh, the acronym TERMS, T-E-R-M-S. It's time, experience, recognition, money, stuff. So every relationship we have, I don't sit and tell Peter, hey, Peter, you're a really good friend. Here's $100. Peter would like slap me in the face. Like, what the fuck is your problem? But like work is just relationships. It's relationships within your work and relationships with the client. 
And that's all business really is, is relationships. And if you have a relationship that only talks with money as a form of exchange of affection or love, you're going to screw that relationship up. So you automatically go into a review and say, here's, an, here's another dollar for sitting in the same seat, or here's another $5. When in actuality, that flexibility, that time, experiences, recognition, money stuff, what is most important to you? What would, what would be a good token of appreciation for what I did? Well, what I'd really love is I'd love to have the week of January off. I mean, of the week, the first week in January off, or I'd really love the ability to, uh, you know, have student loans and I'd love to have, you know, someone help me with my student loans. I mean, these are such important things that actually may not cost you money if they repay you or, or you make an exchange, but we only talk in money and it sucks that we're, that we've kind of strapped our hands to only talk in dollars. And that's just an, that's a hard thing to communicate if you're only talking in dollars. Yeah. Chris, so we can buy your book. I want to be, uh, I know we've got a hard stop here, so I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it. So we can I had too much your, coffee too. You can buy you guys. You guys were great together. Um, it's on Amazon, right? Or should, yeah. or should those of us who want it be directed to so just buy it on Amazon? Buy okay. it. Yeah. I mean, or, I mean, and it should be now that we were a bestseller last week, it should be at Barnes and Noble. It'll be, we'll be in airports soon. And I mean, we should be pretty wow. much everywhere. That's awesome. Congrats, man. I can't big wait time. to read it. Big time. Yeah, I'm psyched. I, I mean, I'm uh, there's a big book signing tonight locally. I'm going to the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get my own autograph from. Yes. The Chris if you guys all didn't order enough books to support me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pete, remember that with ours. That's funny. I would have, <laughs> I'll buy one right now. Actually, I'm going to go out and buy it. You got a lot of reviews too. 62 five-star reviews, which is sick. That's so cool, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think I, I, I leave everyone with no matter what we've got to, we've got to change the way that we're running our organizations. And I think deep down, my intentions are so pure around writing this book. And it's, I think a massive need and deficit in creating real human to human connection and creating an environment of love and empathy. And I think people will find that not only do I talk about it and back it up with stats, but I've got tactics that you can actually put into place and some which have come from you guys. So I appreciate all of your help. And I know you both very well. And I'm, I'm sitting here looking at you. I'm like, you guys are like super similar and you don't know each other, but you're very similar. Craig, you need to be the millennial whisperer for dentists. Like, you know, they had an e-myth for dentists. You need to be like, <laughs> the guy because you're i always i always joke with him chris i'm like you're the tony robbins of dentistry everyone just gravitates towards you like craig has i've never seen someone have so many best friends in all my life right (laughs) like i i can count mine in like one sentence like five one hand there you go there's my friends but craig's like no my good buddy this i'm like i've never heard of this guy he's like yeah (laughs) got a hundred best friends like right and everyone loves him because he's such a giver and 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 doing and they they don't like me because i'm a giver too sometimes yeah just don't take it away craig yeah, I, I think uh, you said something earlier that really resonated with me, Chris, and, and you were talking about love and compassion, and, and there's a very well-known um, uh, idea that all communication, communication is only two, two things to do. It, the, all, the goal of communication is only is binary, is one of two things. It's either a loving expression or a cry for help, nothing else. So either you're giving someone a loving expression or you're just injured and you're reaching out for help. That's all it is. So if you can go about everything that ever comes out at you, every communication that ever comes out at you and see the difference and, and know that a cry for help just needs a little bit of massaging to get to a loving expression, it, it, makes, um, it makes it very simple. Yeah, I love that. And you know, I think a big thing that I talk about a lot is it's one thing saying, it's another thing doing. And one of my favorite things I talk about in the book is turn your let's into a buy when. There's nothing worse than people saying, let's write a book. All right, then do it. Like, so answer your let's with a buy when. And I think, I think you know, to, uh, to a large part, we all live in this world where we like to talk. But now let's actually, let's, let's walk the talk. So, so answer that let's with, okay, buy when. I mean, yeah, yeah, and actually super. implement this. Implement this just, yeah, let's grab, how many times does someone say, let's grab a drink or let's grab coffee? And then nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Next time someone says that to you, say buy when. And they're going to be like, uh, yeah. and they say, next two weeks. And it happens. Yeah, we have in our, in our huddle, we actually have the buy when board. It's I our, love it. So the buy when board has four things. It has what it is, the champion. So the champion means you're not going to do it, but you're responsible for the result. 
So we, we've got to always remember that even though you're not volunteering to do it, you're just going to make sure that it gets done and then buy when. And the best part about a buy when is canceling it off. Because if you say you should do something, Tony always says you should all over yourself. Most people should all over themselves. Yeah. And you ruin your own integrity when you say, I'm going to do this. And you don't put the buy when because long term, you won't do it. And you'll feel like a jackass. And you'll lose trust in yourself. Totally. The worst thing you can do is lose trust in yourself and lose, lose that for yourself. So even just for yourself. Totally. Right? Great to cross things off of a buy when board. It's totally. public recognition. So we're like, Erica, congratulations. We did this. And everybody applauds it. So we have yeah. a buy when board. I thought that was funny. That's a good pearl for people too. Yeah, buy one. I like that. I might, I might steal that too, Craig. Yeah, steal it. That's for a second edition. <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's so good. You got, uh, a, book, you got a couple more books in you, Craig. Uh, we'll see. If I'm Pete wants to do it, I'm not, I'm not doing it without Pete. No, no, I'm, I'm tapped out. I was a one and done. Oh, then I'm going to do one. I'll do one with you, Chris. Yeah, yes. there we go. There see, we go. See, Careful. Everything happens for a reason. Um, oh, I love this conversation. This is a good reminder to me because I'm coming in today. Listen, we all get beat up. I'm coming in today a little beat up because of the conversations I had to have. And uh, it was a really kind of divine guidance for me to recognize that, hey, this is, you know, that you were the one banging on the drum about this five, six years ago. So don't, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't lose your way. So this is cool. Thank you guys. Well, everybody go buy his book, support him. He's one of my good buddies and just a good human. So, um, yeah, Chris, I can't wait to watch you just watch your rocket ship continue to, to go into to, to orbit here, pal. Um, and thanks for, thanks for taking the time. I know you got a ton of stuff to do. You got a book signing here in about, what, five hours and yeah. uh, a lot of prep for that. So thanks for taking the time to come on with us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was uh, awesome meeting you, man. Yeah, awesome stuff you guys are doing. Thank you, pal. Awesome. All right, until next time, Bulletproof listeners, we'll see you later. See you guys.